Fields. On the show today, we have Jason McPhee, an engineer for the state of California, and Steve Hoverman, who is a, a, a self-described hobby optometrist, whatever that means. That means you don't work full uh, as many I hours. I help people as see as a hobby. What? We help people volume. see as That's a hobby. Right. Oh, yeah, this was like an audio thing. Okay. Uh, and uh, the... Broadcasting today on Channel 17 Hi, in Sacramento. We'll be talking on uh, YouTube and we'll be uh, on Facebook at the uh, the Libertarian Counterpoint uh, dot org and uh, a couple other places. Uh, if you want to watch us live, watch us at www.accesssacramento.org, uh, org, Channel 17. Uh, Adam Kokesh uh, a couple of weeks ago was uh, driving down a, a highway in Texas. Now Adam Kokesh is a, a libertarian activist, been around since. Uh, he uh, got out of the Marine Corps protesting against the uh, Iraq war. And uh, he was driving an RV uh, on the highways and byways of Texas when he was pulled over for doing 74 and a 65. Tell us what happened at that point, Jason. Well, what's unusual is when they uh, finally pulled him over, there were several police cops there. So that's, uh, I, to me, it says he was only going about nine miles and over the speed limit. and. It was pretty odd if you watch the video that's on, on the site uh, that's uh, posted in a lot of places out there. It shows uh, like three or four police cars actually there for just what should be a routine traffic stop. And they even had a drug sniffing dog going around his vehicle too, which I guess they eventually found uh, a really small amount of marijuana in his, in his vehicle and, and uh, that led to an arrest, I guess. I'm not quite sure uh, what's happened since then, but, uh, uh, but he was arrested. And, but it just seemed really odd to be pulled over for a, a routine traffic stop and, and have a, three or four police cars right there and all this within about an hour of announcing for the uh, Libertarian Party, I guess. So He announced as he, t he filed papers to yeah. run for president uh, on the Libertarian Party ticket. Yeah. So and within hours, pulled over, uh, actually pulled over a second time. He was pulled over, I think, uh, you know, a few hours before. And uh, pulled over a second time uh, to uh, uh, be uh, on a traffic stop. So yeah, very very strange. Now uh, I don't know that much about uh, Adam other than he uh, was uh, an activist against the uh, Iraq War. Uh, he's been around the Libertarian Party speaking circuit for a number of years. Uh, will this help or hurt his uh, candidacy for uh, the LP uh, presidential nomination? Well, if they just show what's up, what he videoed of himself, it should help. But there's other comments and other things that will change soon. He's, what, in jail at the moment, the last we heard. And they haven't told us what he's been charged with other than the possession or what's going to come of it. Well, Texas is not a legal uh, recreational marijuana state right. by any means, as far as I know. It's still... So the feds have him. Yeah, it's still... Well, it's a federal law, mm -hmm. but, but this was a state arrest. But Texas doesn't make a difference. Uh, in Texas, it's uh, it's illegal, uh, both uh, state and, and and of course federal. Well, and it just uh, goes to hammer home the point too of a victimless crime. <laughs> Here's a person who wasn't pulled over for for doing anything particularly dangerous. I, I think uh, nine miles over the speed limit. I think almost every driver alive can yes. testify to doing something close to that. So. Well, you know, the, the old, uh, the, there's a book, uh, Three Felonies a Day, and if you do nine miles over the speed limit, frequently enough, it turns into a, a felony. Yes. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Not to mention the, dro the, the drug-sniffing dogs who can be, from my, from my understanding, they can be, a tra they can be uh, trained to alert under just about any circumstance. Yeah. If you're and traveling down the highway, I wonder if they were alerted at that stage. Yeah. Um, in, in San Francisco, uh, there is a homeless problem. I don't think anybody would deny that, like Sacramento, like uh, most uh, mild weather cities uh, in California, there is a problem with homeless people living on the streets and so forth. But now they have robots monitoring the homeless. Tell us how that uh, came about. Well, they had robots. They had robots, okay. Thanks for the correction. In the, in the Mission District, which is fairly high class, so I'm not familiar with it. The Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to the Animals, SPCA, was having trouble with the homeless staying on their property. So they put in a robot, which is an interesting looking bullet-shaped robot, to scan, see who was there, 
Sort of like I2D2. Or yes, like yes, R2D2. very, very similar. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and that scared the homeless away. So they, of course, protested. And the SPCA has kindly stopped running the robot, which means the homeless now have a place to stay. But they're trying to gentrify the, the complication, the con contradiction, was the homeless didn't want the area to be gentrified similar to the Google bus that goes there or travels from San Francisco down to Silicon Valley. They don't want the, any more of the signs of gentrification in the area. They're trying to keep it you know, low-key where the homeless feel welcome. So there's a contradiction, you know, do we take care of them? Where do we put them? Or do we take care, let the uh, Silicon Valley people take care of their people? It seems also like it's, it's kind of an interesting issue because the city in the end is the one who forced them to, to pull back their, uh, their robots or, or bum bots, I guess. <laughs> and so the, the, the issue, and I, I think the SPCA even labeled their robot K9, I, maybe yes. some irony there, I don't know. But um, the idea that uh, uh, the city isn't doing a very good job of, of keeping the sidewalks uh, in a manner so that I guess they're their customers and their employees can use them very safely and so they try to take matters into their own hands and then they're being sort of slapped back for it so it's sort of like a no-win situation I guess um, but it also too the part of the issue I think also is whether or not the robots were on the SPCA property or on the yeah. sidewalk and so if they were on the sidewalk then it starts to get into you know public property versus private property issue but. Well, San Francisco is also the city where it's impossible to be arrested for, for shoplifting. <laughs> Seriously, uh, if you are uh, caught shop, shoplifting by a store owner, store owner calls the cops and says, hey, we just nabbed somebody for shoplifting, the cops will say, turn them loose. They, sure. will, they will not do anything. They will not arrest anybody for shoplifting. It's uh, a low priority crime in San Francisco. Well, uh, it's kind of, kind of funny on that note. Which makes you wonder, yeah. what are the high priority yes. crimes? Sure. Well, you know, it's funny, on a little tangent to that, I, I recently, uh, somebody tried to steal my bicycle here in downtown Sacramento, and I, I, I had to push the person off of the, you know, uh, trying to cut the cable of my bicycle, I had to push them away, and then they just walked off, and I, I had pictures, the, the store, the subway had video that, uh, you know, the bike was locked up in front of, you know, and, and it was funny because I tried to give that stuff to the police, and there was no way to give them the, the pictures or the video in, the, in a digital age like this. I, I tried to give it to the person over the phone. They said, file a police report. I go to file a police report. There's no place to upload this. I clearly say that I have all of this, you know, uh, these pictures of the people, that we have video of them trying to cut it. And In other words, you've got visual evidence exactly, of the visual. perpetrator, and yes. we would like to give it to you. Never mind. And that was a month ago, and I still have yet to hear from the police about it. And meanwhile, this guy is uh, out stealing more bikes and selling them on Craigslist or something. Yes. So that's bit frustrating. <laughs> yeah. So these robots, again, are videoing you know, things happening, but we can't use them other than to scare them away. Yeah. Well, I guess, it, I, I, and again, my question is what, if, this, if, the, if, if shoplifting, bike stealing, and uh, squatting on public property are low priority crimes, what are the high priority crimes? Because I don't hear a whole lot about, I, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. What it is that the uh, uh, police departments in San Francisco and Sacramento think are, are higher priority than going after crimes against property? I guess murder and uh, killing cops, maybe. Uh, that's about all I can think of. Well, the sad thing is, crimes against property usually lead to violence yeah. later on. I mean, if somebody tries to defend their property or anything else. When we get onto a later topic, I'll bring that up because I've had the ICE policemen at my door three times in six months. That's a whole other topic. Which would be a federal issue, yes. Federal, yes, yes. Uh, we'll another that. issue is the, the rise, fall, rise, fall, rise, fall, all in, 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 in real quick time of, uh, of cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin and so forth. Uh, Bitcoin made a high around $20,000 today. It was back down, recently it was back down to, to $10,000. Uh, it keeps going up and down like a yo-yo. If you bought it back when it was originally issued, you could have bought uh, one Bitcoin, could have bought three pizzas uh, from, or two pizzas from, from Papa John's. So, I mean, it's been a wild ride, both up and down. 
uh, so much of a wild ride on the upside that uh, very unlikely actors are getting into the cryptocurrency business, including uh, the uh, government, the socialist government of Venezuela under Nicolas Maduro is issuing a petrol uh, cor currency, a petrol coin. Uh, what's the prognosis of a cryptocurrency having any legs whatsoever in a country that has moved inflation to the hundreds of thousands of percent of their actual boulevard? Well, it, it seems like uh you know, it's it's uh, sort of magical thinking of this uh, socialist government thinking that they can just make a fiat cryptocurrency and therefore it'll be successful. I mean, they've, they've already got the regular currency and that's uh, inflated 4,000 percent, I think, in 2017. So they didn't manage that currency very well. And so they hear about another currency doing well. So then they decide, well, you know, uh, let's let's just see if we can. Uh, create some magic here. And it's funny too because uh, in the same story I was reading about this on, they had talked about uh, Maduro earlier in 2017, uh, they, they've got some severe hunger problems and so he had proposed, I guess, uh, uh, a rabbit for every household. <laughs> <laughs> and and there hasn't been any talk about that since the proposal, so that hasn't materialized. No, no rabbits have uh, multiplied? And, I guess uh, not. And I, I, jumped I, into every uh, soup pot? Sure, and I, and I, I think with the uh, cryptocurrency, I think this will be like pulling a rabbit out of a hat for them too. So <laughs> I wouldn't expect too much out of it. Well, if our federal governments around the world can play the fiat money, why can't Venezuela? Well, I mean, the dollar has a has a, what was it that uh, French President de Gaulle said uh, a, 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 a an unfair privilege. I forget the, the exact words that he that he used, but the the, the dollar because it's, it's a petrodollar, it's backed. We have a well, the Not dollar was taken off the gold standard by President Nixon. His then Secretary of uh, State Henry Kissinger made a deal with uh, Saudi Arabia, saying to Saudis will protect the monarchy, will protect the Saudi monarchy with military force, of U.S. military force, if you price oil in dollars and only in dollars. So if anybody wants to buy oil from the, uh, the fount of oil in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, you have to pay for it in dollars. And so in order for the Philippines to buy oil or for uh, Romania to buy anybody to buy oil from Saudi Arabia, and a lot of people buy oil from Saudi Arabia, you had to get the dollars first which provided a uh, an artificial floor, so to speak, under the dollar, the dollar against the yeah. current petrodollar. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, uh, Maduro was trying to have a, a petro cryptocurrency. But the problem is he's trying to pledge oil assets for backing for the cryptocurrency. The problem is he's already pledged them to to uh, international lenders and to... Russia and China. <laughs> Russia, right. yeah. I, I, I'm, not, I, I, I'm guessing they have senior rights and probably will exercise them. Mm -hmm. Well, if he can give them Venezuelans dollars, bitcoins... Give them in exchange, I'm sure yeah, that's going to work. They might out. accept it, yeah. if they're foolish enough. <laughs> uh, you were mentioning that uh, you had uh, visits from ICE. Mm -hmm. Motel 6 has yes. had visitors from ICE. In fact, Motel 6... Uh, has shared customer information uh, with ICE, that's Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Uh, and uh, there are certain states like Washington State and cities like uh, San Francisco where, which, you know, uh, call themselves and have written into law that they are sanctuary cities or sanctuary states where they refuse to cooperate with uh, Immigration and Customs uh, as far as the, uh, the, uh, the arrest and deportation of illegal immigrants. Tell us a little bit about your experience yeah. okay. and how that works as far as uh, Motel 6. I'll carry on with Motel 6. It was fascinating. Their headquarters, Motel 6's headquarters, is in the state of Washington. So is the Washington Supreme Court or Washington bureaucracy charged Motel 6 for having released that information down in Arizona and a couple Motel 6's in the state of Washington. So they're being charged like two thousand dollars a day. Okay, so they're having, violating state law right. by following federal law. Right. Okay, and there's nothing Kafka ask about that. It's two-handed, yeah. Catch twenty-two, but the state makes the money uh, for the fines. But what they ICE is going to do with that information is another question. I think they've already deported a couple people from that list. There were a couple thousand people on the list that they 
turned over. Mm -hmm. But my situation, uh, I've got a visitor staying in the house. He's been there a year. Last Christmas, he went to uh, back to Brownsville, Texas, which is his home. He's one of the border people. His family lives in the U.S. in Brownsville now, but he was born in Mexico, so he doesn't have his citizenship. He actually grew up in Michigan, where his family settled down. They had been migrant laborers, but he still didn't get his license, his residency. He's now out here following his kids, and here again at Christmas he went to Michi back to Brownsville. So twice there, the ICE came to my door asking for is Gil here. He wasn't there, thankfully, luckily, so they went away. But we were, they were being watched. So Gil came back here in January, and they came to the door one more time. Gil was apparently wise enough, I didn't know, I'm learning as I go. If you're inside the property, they can't take you away. Oh. If he was stepped outside, they could have picked him up. Mm -hmm. Then for New Year's or th Christmas, Adam, you, you know Adam, and I and Gil were going to go out for lunch. So we drove to a restaurant and got a call from Gil's lawyer that Gil, in driving to, my, to the restaurant, was stopped and picked up and brought downtown. The ICE de uh, detention center is right here in Sacramento, right near the Capitol. So they had him put away for a while until we were able to get him out on bail. But it, has to, it goes back to his ex-wife charging him with, uh, he was not supposed to see his, have any contact with his kids, but he went to watch his son's uh, soccer game, which put him on their bad list. So he's now broken a law by going to watch his kid play soccer. So we'll see what comes of that over the next couple of months. So he was he's, detained by, he's, yeah. but he hasn't been deported. Not deported. But he, but he could be. He could be, and the office that you go to I got to see their office downtown, uh, trying to help protect and get him out, is the detention and deportation office. Okay. So it's too close to us, I think. But So I'm rather glad we're looking at being a sanctuary state. I think that's a good idea. What period does a man who's now 40 some years old have to live, live in the US all his life? Yeah. At what point does he or do we become citizens? He's a hard worker. Well, I, yeah, I mean, the 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 the, the hue and chorus that you yeah, hear from the, right. the nativists, the people who are anti-immigrant, mm. is you should come here legally and go yeah. through the you know wait at the end of the line. There is no line. There is no there is no real way, real effective way for uh, Mexicans or most uh, most uh, people from other countries to become U.S. citizens unless you want to wait. 50 or 100 years. It's and just, it's just looking not at the possible. history of immigration, if you call it that, the Spanish came up from Mexico and claimed Texas and California. We were the done, took it away from them. So there are historical heritage Spanish up in here, Mexicans, here all along, many years. Yeah, and if you look at immigration law, right. there was no immigration law. There was law. no law. There was no right. immigration law whatsoever prior to the late yes. 1800s. Yes. The first immigration law, interestingly enough, was. Uh, a law against the Chinese mm -hmm. because the, and, and it was in California because the, uh, the nativists in California who had imported the Chinese to work in the gold fields and to build the railroad decided that uh, now that the railroad's built and the gold is played out, mm -hmm. we don't want them here anymore. So they decided to make it impossible for the Chinese to stay. So that was the first, and it was racially based. It was, uh, you know, a, a racial law, no Chinese need to apply like no Irish need to apply. Uh, that was, uh, you know, in the late 19th century. The first, uh, actually, the first immigration law was to ban, uh, I think it was prostitutes and gamblers or something like that. It was, it was, you know, basically a vice law. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. But the, the, the larger point is that immigration took place freely, no restriction, no problem, from the found, from the, the settling of the country back in the right. uh, 14, 1500s up until the late part of the 19th century the fastest growing part of United States history, a part of United States history where there was no welfare because there didn't need to be any welfare because everybody was making a living settling the country and, and, and working and having a job and, and you know, it was, it was not necessary. 
That's a period of high immigration. Now we have a, a period of al almost impossible immigration and uh, a, a labor force participation rate that goes back to lows not seen since the 1960s when most, when a large ma majority of women were, or a large proportion of, of, of women were not in the workforce yet. Well, and this is what's interesting too, and you touched upon it, is when the concerns start coming up about immigration, it happens just a little bit before, but a lot of the laws start happening as we start developing a, a social welfare state too, you know, so as you we get to the uh, early mid 20th century and suddenly you start to grow the state and expand services and then people start to become concerned about those things and it's a tragedy because in the end, if somebody wants to come from anywhere in the world and work for somebody else, why should anybody else care? That's a consensual relationship. Yeah, and the whole idea they're taking our jobs is nonsense because sure. everybody that comes and takes a job earns money, spends money, providing a job for somebody else. Sure. It's, it's a win-win situation. No jobs, yes. no jobs are lost. More jobs are, for every job that's lost, another one is created. It's just, it's just it, you know, it's called economic growth, and, and which, is a, which is, you know, used to be a good thing. And the same argument can be made in when you import a product, too. Essentially, you're, you're buying from somebody else, not a native, therefore you've just taken a job, but most people don't have a big problem with well, going to your do. Walmart some store. Some people do. <laughs> some people do, sure. the whole buy American crowd. But, but again, you're, you're, you're making an assumption that because somebody was born in, uh, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, uh, across the border in Mexico, as opposed to in San Diego, Tijuana versus San Diego, that somehow or another, the person born in San Diego has rights and privileges above the person who was born inches away uh, in Tijuana, which, which is, you know, uh, that's a very strange reasoning. It might be law, but it's not very good logic. And we do have a lot of attraction for a lot of Latin Americans, besides Mexicans, to come up here. So we've had a lot of other countries send their folk, even yeah. their children, over the last few years, now with the DACA. And of course, uh, immigration and the whole nativist anti-immigration uh, memes are expressed vehemently and at length on social media. Mm. Now we have a situation where uh, people are, uh, politicians in particular, I think for the most part Democratic politicians, are trying to make it illegal to post derisive comments on public web pages. Freedom of speech issue there? First Amendment issue? It would seem like it. I mean, they're... Seem? <laughs> yes. Well, they're, they're citing a California penal code that has to do with miscellaneous uh, infractions, I, I think it is. I think it's a 653 or something is what they call it. And it's uh, uh, apparently if, if you are using a phone or other electronic media and you are harassing somebody over it, then they're saying that that can be something that, that they can charge you with... Uh, um, you know, uh, and they, they can charge you with a crime. And, and the, the crazy thing is in this particular case, it was a public web page, and it was, I, I can't remember the specifics about the web page, but it was there for people to, to make comments about things. Well, apparently somebody made comments uh, that was against whatever the program was, and they didn't really like that, and so they, they decided to charge him with a crime, I guess. Yeah. And what are the penalties for this crime? Yeah. Totally sure. <laughs> yeah. He blasted the website with criticisms, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. rather slanderous, but no, we would disagree one hundred percent with the right. comments that were posted. That's right. Probably, I, I, but I he didn't read the right them in detail. Up. But more than likely, we would disagree. But we would also applaud and totally support the right to make those comments, knowing that we can sit here and make comments that yeah. are in direct opposition. The answer to bad speech is more speech, mm -hmm. not. He's Let's filling the speech. website. He's filling the. And media. when it comes to you know the neo Nazis, the uh, the fascists, the uh, you know the disreputable people of all stripes, the more they talk, the more they the flat earthers, the more they talk, the more they discredit themselves. Mm -hmm. Let them talk as much as give them a big platform, and and you know and they will talk themselves into oblivion. That's you know the, the answer to bad speech is more speech. Sure, you know part of the issue in this case too though is that if it had been a private web page where you know you hacked into somebody's private property. That would be like maybe crossing their fence or something. And in that case, I, I could see it. But in this case, it was open for public comment. So it seems a little disingenuous, I think, to, to be able to charge somebody with a crime when you essentially invited people to come in there and, and have their say. 
the Trump tax uh, cut uh, finally passed uh, Congress, and uh, I, there's, it has a whole lot of problems, but one of the uh, uh, benefits, or one of the pur purported benefits, is that it will benefit wage earners, uh, common people, by uh, giving them uh, more take-home pay. Trickle-down economics is the derisive way of, uh, of uh, talking about that. Does trickle-down actually work? I would say it works, but that's again in theory. In practice, do those lower people, uh, I think because of our income inequality, it hasn't worked. This money on top hasn't flown down. It's just bubbled even higher. Well, folk down at the participation job level, our incomes are not increasing. Well, I, I would just take issue with the whole term, I guess, yes. trickle down. Mm -hmm. the, the idea of yes. calling something trickle down when it's people freely exchanging with one another and whatever comes of that, I, I think the expectation that, that somehow two people come into a consensual relationship, they exchange, they're both better for it. So they, they, didn't, they wouldn't have done it had they not been better for it, at least, you know, uh, um, all things equal before, you know. But... Um, the, the, the problem is for people to expect that somehow they, they have some further claim on that exchange, which is, I think, what the whole idea of trickle-down is, is the idea that, well, if somebody did well in an exchange, then, then I should forever get some benefit from those people. And well, the, the problem silly. with the whole, the whole trickle-down, not trickle-down argument is that it kind of begs the question, which is we have an economy that's been gamed by monetary policy for the, ever since the 1970s and arguably since 1913. Uh, we have a, a, an economy where money is lent into existence, lent into existence. If it's not borrowed by somebody, it doesn't exist. If it's lent into existence, that means debt goes up. That means the people who have good credit have first access to newly created, and by newly created I mean created out of the ether, created out of nothing, newly created money goes to people who have good credit in the first place, meaning the rich, the 1%, however you want to describe them. They take that money and they use it to Invest. speculate in the stock market, and the stock market has done very well because there's all of this new money floating in to the stock market, the bond market, both uh, uh, domestically and internationally. So all of the new wealth creation has gone to the people who are already rich, very little of it has trickled down to the uh, working class because not much of it is being reinvested. Most of it is being used for speculation. That's not a, a fault of capitalism. That's the fault of a, uh, a cynically managed monetary system, which is uh, the Federal Reserve and central banks all over the world. And uh, that's about the time. So we'll wrap it up. That's. Uh, Libertarian Counterpoint for one more week. We'll see you again next week at www.accesssacramento.org, on YouTube, on uh, Facebook. Libertarian Counterpoint, thank you very much. We'll see you next week.